Hello, everybody. Happy Tuesday to you. Welcome to the new and improved Tuesday version of this program. I am John Allen, the president and editor of Crux, your one-stop shopping destination for the very best in smart, wired, and independent Catholic journalism. You can find us online at cruxnow.com. I'm also the host of this show, Last Week in the Church. This is the show where we take leftover Catholic news. It's usually a few days old. But we throw it into our skillet, sprinkle over some special spices, add the secret Crux brand sauce, and serving, serving up a piping hot and delicious fresh dish. Here's what we've got in the menu for you this week. Several of our stories this week concern the exercise of papal authority in some way. We begin with the Vatican's trial of the century, where the new figure in the dock, the new defendant whose record is under examination, is actually Pope Francis himself. Then we look at a couple of new legal decrees Pope Francis issued this week. One has to do with a restructuring of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, which Vatican spokespersons are describing as an important step forward in the fight against clerical sexual abuse in the Catholic Church. Another having to do with, well, broadly speaking, decentralization. Pope Francis took some powers away from the Vatican this week and gave them back to local bishops. Then we consider a big-time symposium on the priesthood underway in the Vatican. Several Vatican heavy hitters are there. It is being sponsored by the uber-important Congregation for Bishops under Canadian Cardinal Mark Ouellette. And a sense authority figures into this story, too, because one of the big subjects there is the issue of clericalism. Tied to that, also a fair bit of talk about priestly celibacy. Then we look at the, the increasingly risky situation in Ukraine and a new sort of offer by the Vatican ambassador, I'm sorry, by, by Ukraine's Vatican ambassador, not so much an offer, but an invitation for the Vatican to help mediate that conflict and allied with that sense of urgency about getting Pope Francis on the ground in Ukraine. And finally, we're going to look at what I consider to be one of the most creative diocesan fundraising efforts I have ever seen. It's in the Diocese of Allentown, Pennsylvania, and it's called Cookin' with Collars. I love it. That's what we've got for you this week, so please stick around. All right, so we begin this week with the Vatican's so-called trial of the century. Well, it's really called that mostly by me, but I'm trying to make it stick. Basically, this is this mega trial involving 10 different defendants, including for the very first time a cardinal of the Catholic Church, Italian Cardinal Angelo Becciu, for their role in a highly controversial and massively failed effort by the Vatican Secretary of State to buy property in London using income from Peter's Pence. That's the collection from Catholics around the world. It's usually marketed as a way to help out in papal charities, you know, feed starving babies in Africa and so on. But if you read the fine print, it says the Pope can do whatever he wants with this money. And so part of it went to try to, trying to buy this property. The Vatican has lost millions. They are alleging they were bilked and extorted by a constellation of different figures, including lay Italian financiers, their own financial experts inside the Secretary of State, and even a former papal chief of staff, Cardinal Becciu. So if you watch this show, you know that from the beginning last year, this trial has been bogged down in issues around what in America we would call discovery. Basically speaking, the defense has charged that the prosecution has failed to turn over key bits of evidence. The court has ordered them to turn over this evidence multiple times. They, they still haven't done it to the defense's satisfaction. Those issues are still hanging around. But in the most recent hearing this week, a new bone of contention emerged as defense lawyers, one for one of those lay financiers who doesn't work for the Vatican, another for the Vatican, the Secretary of State, the guy who, who basically served as the 
money manager for the Secretary of State for a long time. These lawyers alleged that a series of decrees that Pope Francis issued at the beginning of this process essentially violated their client's basic legal and human rights. The, the Pope, when this trial began, issued four what are known here as rescripts, authorizing special authority for prosecutors that deviate from the Vatican's normal criminal procedure. Among other things, it allowed prosecutors to, to do wiretaps and electronic intercepts, so like seizing email accounts and so on, of defendants without ever obtaining a judge's approval. It allowed them to physically detain suspects for indefinite periods of time, again, without any prior judicial review, and also allowed them to collect evidence in ways that just normally speaking wouldn't be kosher. Now, all of this, of course, from one point of view, was testimony to Pope Francis's determination to impose accountability for these alleged financial crimes. Critics, however, would say it is another a chapter in Pope Francis, quite frankly, abusing his authority. And, you know, if you think about it, it is true that the way that this investigation unfolded just is not how it normally would work in most legal systems. Like, for instance, say you want to bug some guy's phone. I mean, we've all watched Law and Order. You know, we know what has to happen. You have to go, go to a judge and you got to get a warrant. We've all seen those scenes where, you know, McCoy and whoever his assistant is, whether it's Claire or Selena, or I don't really remember the rest, but, you know, that succession of number twos are sitting around in their office debating whether they have enough evidence for a warrant. Footnote, by the way, I learned during the Super Bowl commercials that Law and Order is coming back, which I just think is great news. Frankly, I have no idea why it ever stopped. To me, like, having a law and order on TV is like gas or electricity. It's just a basic public service, and it should always be there. So uh, I think just a spectacular development. Anyway, point is, in this case, prosecutors had tremendous latitude, and defense attorneys are now arguing uh, that that violated their client's due process rights. Now, look. The, the Pope is also the supreme judicial authority in the Vatican, right? This tribunal has no authority to set aside his rescripts in the way a court in the United States might be able to set aside a president's executive order. That's just not how it works. But on the other hand, the judges in this trial, led by Chief Justice Giuseppe Pignatani, or presiding justice, rather, do have the authority to basically toss out this whole thing if they decide that the defense has not been playing on a level playing field. And we should say at this hearing, at the very end, Pina Tony said at their next hearing in early March, he will set a calendar for future activity. And then he added, if there is future activity. So obviously, it'll be very fascinating to track how this plays out. It is really the first time anyone in the Vatican has been asked to deliver a formal assessment of whether Pope Francis has abused the authority of the papacy. You know, I don't know what the odds are, but I know it's going to be interesting no matter how it shakes out. All right, other evidence of the Pope wielding the powers of his office this week. Pope Francis issued a motu proprio, which is basically a legal instrument that says the Pope is doing this on his own initiative, not in response to anybody's request. Restructuring the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, that is the all-important doctrinal watchdog in the Vatican. Over the centuries, it was known as La Suprema in the Vatican because it was the supreme congregation. And that is, because, of course, because every matter of doctrinal interest is subject to its review. And let's face it, there's not a heck of a lot that the Vatican does that in one way, shape, or form isn't of doctrinal interest. Okay, so they basically had veto power on a wide range of stuff. Now, that's a little bit tamped down in the Pope Francis era. But the other thing that happened beginning in 2001 is that the Congregation for the Faith got the responsibility for the legal response to all cases of clerical sexual abuse, and that continues to be the case. 
Now, trying to do both of these things at once, that is, being the Vatican's doctrinal watchdog and also handling its legal caseload for sex abuse, has always been a bit problematic for the CDF. I mean, this was one of the reasons that in the late John Paul years, there was a huge backlog of cases in the CDF. They had to get volunteer canon lawyers from the states and other places to come over here and help them sort through it all. So what Pope Francis has done, he has taken these two sections within the CDF, basically the doctrinal section and the disciplinary section, and made them almost independent by giving them each their own secretary. Now, in most Vatican dicasteries, everybody knows that the cardinal prefect may set the tone, but it's the archbishop secretary who does all the work, you know, who, who makes the trains run on time. And now there will be two of those rather than one in the CDF. And the idea is that that will give more autonomy and more leadership to the disciplinary section, helping it coordinate and accelerate its management of clerical sexual abuse cases. If that works out as promised, it could be a very important reform. If it simply duplicates bureaucracy, and by the way, creates the possibility of internal tensions between these two secretaries so nobody actually knows who's in charge, which is, by the way, entirely plausible. That's how it worked out when Pope Francis named two cardinals to the Dicastery for Integral Human Development, right? So it, it could actually make things worse. You know, we don't know, but again, going to be very interesting to watch. That was Monday. On Tuesday, Pope Francis issued yet another motu proprio, extending his all-time lead as pope in the number of these decrees he's issued. I mean, this guy, by the time he's done, he is going to be the Henry Aaron of motu proprio, <laughs> you know, the, the guy who has the all-time record not tainted by steroids. This motu proprio was intended to achieve a degree of decentralization in the Catholic Church. Basically, it took certain powers traditionally reserved to Rome, so the power to approve the erection of interdiocesan seminaries, to approve the publication of regional catechisms, to dismiss members of religious, order, uh, religious orders from their order, and a couple of other things, and restores those powers either to bishops' conferences or to regional conferences of bishops, or in certain cases, to individual bishops. Now, in themselves, none of these things are a thunderclap, but they are part of Pope Francis's ongoing effort to achieve what he has described from the beginning as a healthy decentralization in the Catholic Church. The interesting part about all this is that Pope Francis is not achieving decentralization using decentralized means, that is through, you know, some kind of synodal process or wide consultation or putting things up for a vote or, or whatever. He's doing it ramrod style by decree. And, you know, I mean, critics will point to that as irony shading off into, you know, just blatant hypocrisy. Whereas supporters will tell you, hey, you know, sometimes this is what is needed to achieve reform. You need a strong leader with vision. But in any event, I think historically this is going to go down probably as the defining irony of the Francis papacy, that a decentralizing pope governed in a more centralized fashion than, than we, frankly, than we have seen in a very long time. All right, moving on to the symposium on the priesthood going on in the Vatican this week. So this gathering was announced months ago, and as soon as we knew it was going to be happening, it immediately lit up screens in the media world because the assumption was that if we're going to be talking about the priesthood, we're going to be talking about celibacy. Remember, the question of priestly celibacy has been very much in the air of late in debates in the church and in the Vatican. You know, when Pope Francis convened a synod of bishops on the Amazon, there, were, there was much talk there. 
about whether the discipline of priestly celibacy ought to be relaxed in some fashion, made optional, whatever. It was kind of left hanging by the Synod, but completely unresolved. And so it's been around. And so there was an expectation that this Synod was going to perhaps be a turning point in that conversation. Now, the interesting thing is, the priests who are gathering in Rome this week, who come from all around the world, most of them, I think some of them probably volunteered to be here because they found it interesting. Others, I mean, you know, we, we touched base with a priest from the States the other night who's taking place in this shindig, who was basically asked to come here by his vicar for clergy because I think there was the expectation they were supposed to send somebody. And so he hit up this guy who had done a previous Rome shindig, and so he thought maybe he'd be interested. But, but the priests who are from around the world here, as opposed to, say, the media and, and maybe water cooler conversation in the church, quite honestly, don't seem especially interested in the topic of priestly celibacy. I mean, there was a talk on it the other day at this symposium, and my sources tell me that lots of clergy in that room were actually sleeping through it. Now, in part, this just may be, because this is a really heavy Vatican meeting, and there's talk after talk after talk, and, you know, anybody would struggle to stay awake for anything. But I do think it, it is, never, nevertheless, kind of ironic, right, that the outside world seems a Twitter about, you know, what's going to happen with celibacy at this thing. And meanwhile, in the room, you know, people are visiting the Sandman, you know, catching some Z's. Um, and it just wasn't one of the more electric moments, to be completely honest with you. And I think, you know, the, the basic reality, folks, is that for most priests of the Latin Rite, okay, because of course we have married priests in the Oriental churches, but for most priests of the Latin Rite, frankly, they made their peace with celibacy as kind of the price of admission a long time ago. They don't have much realistic expectation it's going to change anytime soon. So talking about it doesn't really add any value to whatever it is they're doing, right? I mean, I think many of them came here hoping to take away some practical ideas that they could go back and implement in their parishes. To be honest with you, mandatory celibacy just ain't one of them. And so the electricity you may find in the media, I would dare suggest, is not matched by the electricity in the room. However, I think one of the more dramatic moments did come with Canadian Cardinal Mark Ouellette's opening address. Because among, among other things, he hit the clerical sexual abuse issue head on and, and just frankly confessed that there are some people who would say that you guys should not be celebrating the priesthood at a time when it has been shamed and humbled in historic fashion. And Willette said that, you know, we need to start out here with a penitential note, and we need to turn this meeting into proof that priests are as committed to justice for the victims and survivors of clerical abuse as the victims and survivors themselves. Moreover, Willette did not shy away from raising the issue of clericalism and said that in some ways this symposium should come down to a referendum on the negatives of clericalism or this idea that priests enjoy kind of exaggerated power and privilege merely by virtue of being introduced into the clerical state. I think it is fair to say that many observers of this symposium would say that Willette's talk was among the more impressive moments. Now, I mention all of this because in addition to the fact it's just noteworthy in itself, Cardinal Willette is also one of the guys who perennially will get a mention as a potential papabile someday, that is, a potential successor to the Pope. Now, he has aged, and many would say that he's passed his sell-by date, but on the other hand, I would remind you that the last two Popes were elected, effectively, at the ages of 78 and 76, so nothing is ever impossible in the Catholic Church. If you are a kind of center-right cardinal, that is, one who's, you know, basically moderate in your inclinations, but you lean a little bit conservative, you would, you would prefer something for the next pope 
a little bit more buttoned down, a little bit more by the book than Pope Francis. But never anybody who's going to repeal Pope Francis's legacy, someone who can carry it forward in what you might see as a somewhat more cautious and centered fashion. I don't know. I think Cardinal Ouellette is a very impressive man, speaks multiple languages, spent many years in Latin America as a missionary, has a lot of friends, and, you know, I mean, let's face it, I think, you know, there, there isn't a plethora, there's not an abundance of people who fit that profile for the center, right? So, you know, I don't know. Eyes peeled is all I'm saying. All right, Ukraine. The, the tensions around Ukraine are, of course, ongoing and getting worse by the day, seemingly. U.S. President Joe Biden has said, we're just one step away from war. Many global leaders uh, are engaged in virtually nothing else these days than trying to avert an armed conflict in Ukraine. Now, the question, and Pope Francis, of course, has spoken out about Ukraine many, many times. This week, the Vatican's representative to the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe gave a talk in which he said war in Ukraine would be madness. He pled for the, you know, the, the parties to this conflict to step back from the brink and once again offered any help the Vatican prov could provide. The question is, what might that help look like? Well, uh, also this week, Ukraine's new ambassador to the Holy See gave an interview to Phil Powella here in Rome uh, of the Reuters news agency, in which Powella asked him that very question. The ambassador reminded Reuters that President Zelensky of Ukraine not so long ago had said that Ukraine would welcome a Vatican mediation of this conflict and said that he felt the Vatican would be a great place to sign a peace treaty that would end the conflict. Zelensky also mentioned, of course, how eagerly Ukraine is awaiting Pope Francis's long-awaited trip to Ukraine. The ambassador went on to reaffirm all of that and said Ukraine remains hopeful that there will be some kind of Vatican mediation effort also hopeful that Pope Francis will come soon, the ambassador said that, you know, in these days, lots of global leaders have been coming to Ukraine, right? And it's true, like, you know, Macron and Boris Johnson are going, and, you know, people are shuffling in and out of there. And he said, that is very important to convince Ukrainians that they have not been forgotten and that the global community still has their back. So we will see if there is some kind of Vatican initiative here. Often the Vatican is a bit loath to being drawn into these conflict situations if there isn't some evidence that both sides are serious about getting something done. You know, Ukraine has put, or, I'm sorry, Russia, President Putin of Russia has put on the table that the prerequisites for any kind of solution here are a kind of permanent, ban uh, on the idea of Ukraine joining NATO, a reduction of NATO's offensive capabilities near the Russian border, and a kind of scale back of NATO's military presence in Europe to pre-1997 levels. Basically, NATO leadership in the White House has said that that's a non-starter, it's, it's never going to happen. And there doesn't seem to be a lot of evidence that either side right now is willing to make major concessions. And so the, the Vatican might have a little bit of just agita uh, about the idea of being drawn into a losing proposition. On the other hand, the Vatican does have other ways and means at its disposal. I would note that Pope Francis's favorite new movement, the community of San Egidio, has quite a history in conflict resolution. It negotiated the end to Mozambique's long-running civil war. The treaty ending that conflict is known as the Treaty of Rome because it was signed at the headquarters of Sant'Egidio here in Rome in the Trastevere neighborhood. Maybe Pope Francis could reach out to Andrea Riccardi, the founder of Sant'Egidio, and say, hey, I'd like you guys to do me a solid 
That's a way for the Vatican to maintain a little bit of distance from the situation, but also still be involved. We'll, we'll see how it plays out. And by the way, there's been no indication from the Russians that they are particularly eager to see the Vatican get involved as a mediator. Uh, you know, but on the other hand, suppose Pope Francis issues invitations to Zelensky and Putin to sit down and talk peace. I don't know, but I think it would be awfully hard for Putin just to say a blanket no. But, you know, we'll see. Finally, this has absolutely jack to do with authority, by the way, or anything else we've been talking about, but it's just a story I absolutely love. This week, the Diocese of Allentown, Pennsylvania, brought to a kind of denouement its second annual fundraising effort, which is called Cooking with Collars. Basically, what they do is get about 30 or so priests around the diocese to do videos showing people how they make their favorite dishes. And then they put them online. And if you make a contribution to the diocese, it's for Catholic charities and also support of parishes. If you make this donation, you can vote on which one you think is the best. So it's like celebrity chef with a Roman collar, kind of. Dishes that were involved in this year's round included Hungarian goulash, world-famous, mouth-dropping French fries, and a really intriguing one, banana beer. Not sure I would like it, but I would love to see how it's made. Probably my favorite moment during this, this cycle of videos is when one of the priest chefs involved appeared on camera wearing an apron that reads, many people have eaten this in, in this kitchen and gone on to lead normal, healthy lives, <laughs> which I just think is absolutely great. I, I tried to, to buy that apron, and I actually did find it on Amazon, but unfortunately it doesn't ship to Italy. So word of the wise, if any of you viewers of this show are in the States at the moment and you're coming to Rome, if you wanted, to pick up that apron for me, I will gladly exchange it for a steaming hot plate of Amatrichana when you get here. So that is an ironclad offer open to anybody out there. You bring me that apron, I will feed you and feed you well. All right, that is our show for this week. Thank you very much for watching. Again, you can find saturation coverage of all this stuff and much more beyond on the Crux site. That is cruxnow.com, cruxnow.com. If you feel so inclined when you go on the site, we have a nice and easy way to, be, to become a financial contributor to Crux. Remember, our independence is our most precious asset, but it is not free. We need your help to pay for it. Over the next seven days, I would like you to stay safe, stay healthy. Have a fantastic and blessed week, and we will talk to you again soon.